Welcome to this event in the 2020 Portobello Book Festival. My name is May Shaw and I'm a member of the organising group. The festival is organised annually by a local group of enthusiastic readers and writers in conjunction with and in support of the local public library. Books featured can be found at the Portobello Bookshop. I would like to thank today's contributors for their willingness to participate in this reconfigured festival. Thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to the Port Bella Book Festival. Um, this year we're online for obviously re reasons, um, but we aim to do as good, uh, give you as good a quality series of events as always. And today I'm here to speak to um, Professor Tom Mole about um, his book, which is The Secret Life of Books. Um, this is about books and we all we all know what books are we love books we read them we take them away with us we maybe write on them we use them for reference we use them for a lot of different things i personally probably wouldn't have as great a job as i do if it wasn't for books so i'm obviously a big fan now this is a book which is about books but it's about more than the more than the words and books, it's about the history, about our relationships with books in so many different ways. And I would say that if we had to make up a person to write a book like this, I don't think there'd be anyone better than um, Tom here. Tom is uh, I'm a professor of English literature and book history from the University of Edinburgh. He's also, he runs the Center for the History of the Book He's the, he's the author of a book previously that has won the Saltar Prize for his research. And he's also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Tom lives in Edinburgh with his wife and daughter. Now, first, Tom, my first question is, there's a lot of, um, there's been quite a number of books just looking at the history of, say, one object and this, the cultural significance of that object. Um, various successes, I would say, um, but of all objects here, why did you think the book, why would you think the book is worthy of this kind of no novel, historical novel, novel of ideas? Yeah, I think books are perfect for this kind of thing because our books are kind of living a double life. On one hand, they are containers for ideas, for entertainment, for stories. On the other hand, uh, books are physical objects. They're things, you know, they take up a certain space in the world. And it's very easy to forget that often when you're absorbed in a book, you know, when you really kind of get into a book and the physical object in your hands almost disappears. But I thought it would be really helpful to just pause for a minute, just pull back and think about the book as a physical object and all the kind of ways in which it becomes important to us as individuals and, uh, you know, to our relationships and to our society. Yeah, you do cover a lot of ground in this book on that line of the book as an object, um, through the meanings and significance of a book might have to ourselves in our personal relationships um, in society as a whole when you also um, look at the history of the technology and of the history of the book itself I mean how did you choose say what to put in and what to put out to leave out well, um, I wanted to move as far as I could from kind of the personal outwards to the general. So I started by thinking about my own experience with books and what first made me pay attention to the physical form of the book as well as to its contents. And then from there, I started to sort of move outwards and think about how books get tangled up with our sense of ourselves but also how we display and communicate that self to other people and then how books become part of our relationships as we share them, give them, receive them and then part of our sense of ourselves as members of groups. For some of us, like you and I, books are an important part of our professional lives and then more generally how books can be important for the way that nations understand themselves. And of course, this is also a good moment to be thinking about all of those things. So I wanted, it's a good moment because, um, you know, we're, we're now living through a transformation 
in the book that I think in the future historians will see as being as important as the invention of printing with movable type. So as we live through this moment where new technologies are challenging the paper and ink book, it's a really good moment to be thinking about what the book means as a physical object. Yes, yes. I mean, you do talk about the resilience of the book as a format. Um, and, you know, very convincingly for me, of course, I have that interest. Um, and particularly how the book, as the convenience of ebook, hasn't led to the predicted demise of the book in, this, in the same way as it perhaps the convenience of modern technology has led to the demise of the CD or the video. I mean, do you, how much of that would you attribute to the physicality or the cultural? Yeah, I think both of those things are really crucial here because, you know, we, we keep hearing predictions of the death of the book that, you know, books are going to disappear and be replaced, that reading is not what it used to be. And there are reasons to be concerned, I think. But I also think that what we tend to overlook in those diagnoses is all the ways in which books as physical objects have become kind of integral to our, our selfhood and our society. So think about all the things that you can do with a physical book that you can't do with an ebook. All the things that we do with physical books that aren't just reading. So, you know, you can now get the Bible or the Talmud or the Quran as an ebook, but it's very unlikely that we'll start to swear on ebooks in court. It's very unlikely that ebooks and e-readers will be ceremonially brought out as part of acts of worship or to shift to a secular mode. Um, it's much less common to give ebooks on significant occasions. And if you do give them, you can't write words marking that occasion in the front in the same way. Um, we, I write in the book about speech day at my school, which was a, a whole kind of festival of distributing prize books. It's very unlikely that ebooks will uh, you know, ever fulfill that function. So there are all kinds of things that physical books are doing in our society apart from just functioning as containers for our reading matter. And once we understand that, I think we can understand why ebooks haven't just been able to take on all of those different functions. If it was just a matter of using books as a vehicle for texts, then we would have given up paper books in favour of ebooks, which can do the job faster, sometimes cheaper, more efficiently just the same way as we've given up telegrams in favour of emails or for, most, for the most part CDs in favour of MP3s. But the book's doing all kinds of other things apart from just delivering text to us and it's those things that we find much harder to give up, I think. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you feel that this might be a, a generational thing, um, that younger people are more familiar with ebooks? Do you think it's a familiarity thing? Also, I was wondering, do you think that possibly um, as with handling cash the current situation might accelerate the use of the virtual and in fact as a holding meetings as well yeah those are both really interesting points i mean i think to take the first one first um is this a generational shift i think it's too early to say to be honest um, there's some evidence uh, from the scientific studies that suggests that reading on paper might just be better in a couple of respects than reading on the screen. So studies that compare these two suggest that people who read on paper tend to retain what they read a little better and they tend to do better in comprehension tests afterwards. So, and that seems to be to do with the medium rather than anything else. But on the other hand, you know, these are studies that have mostly been done on university undergraduates because, of course, they're a very easy population to study. Um, and I wonder if it will be different as we see new generations coming up. My daughter, who's 11 now, has had access to text on screen 
and on the page from before she could read. And really that's still not true, I think, even of, of our current undergraduates. So as a new generation that's learned to read with access to e-readers and screen reading, as that new generation comes up, maybe we will see a shift. And maybe we'll see people put their emotional investments that are currently kind of invested in books, maybe those emotional investments will go somewhere else, right? You can already think, I'm sure, of people who kind of have the sort of emotional investment in their phone that people once would have had in a book. So, you know, these things are culturally constructed, and that means they could be culturally constructed differently in a different time. Mm. Well, it's interesting that you've, you mentioned your daughter there because, I mean, one of the things I felt about um, <clears throat> your book that made it very different from perhaps, um, you know, a standard history of an object or a novel of ideas was the very personal investment you have and the personal touches you put in. For example, your um, I thought your daughter's book group sounded brilliant. It sounded like the kind of book group I would want to be a member of. And it was very, very similar almost to the book group that we have in the library for, for like under 10s. Um, so yeah. what, 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 why did you, I mean, so how much did you, do you feel that you put in, did you want it to be a more personal account rather than, sim, rather than, um, uh, history? Well, I've spent a long time uh, teaching some of this kind of material in universities and I wanted to draw on the knowledge that I'd gained by doing that, but I also wanted to kind of test it against my own experience and I wanted to use my own experience hopefully to engage the reader and hope that people will reading the book will say, oh yes, you know, I, I recognize that I have a similar kind of response to books. Books are certainly very important to me personally, and I uh, am one of those people who can honestly say that books have changed my life. Uh, there weren't a lot of books in our house growing up, but now I'm a professor of English literature and I live in a flat that's absolutely full of books. So um, books have been very important to me personally and professionally. I also think that, um, uh, in terms of um, the book club that you were mentioning, one of the fascinating things I wanted to talk about was the way that books bring people together. We often think of reading as a sort of solitary activity and perhaps even something that takes you away from more valuable social activities. But reading also connects people with each other and books connect people with each other, whether that's through a book club or a society of book collectors or membership of a library or something else. There are lots of ways in which books actually create a kind of sociability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also, you know, everyone has very personal reactions to books and maybe not just about the choice of books, but I think how the things you're talking about, how we might use books in other ways. I mean, one thing that I thought and I thought, is this our profession or is this, you know, is this because of our profession or is it from, is it more me, a personal thing? But you talk with quite a lot of enthusiasm of um, put, annotating books and putting notes in books, which horrified me as a librarian and it's something that I don't do and I just wondered whether this is, this is something where a book how a book's used yeah. and um, is different between professions like a scholar is very very positive of, of about annotating books while a librarian is horrified well listen for, for I can understand why you don't want your books coming back with annotations all over them but um, for me, as a historian of the book, annotations are terrifically useful and so are all kinds of signs of use because they show us how a book has been enjoyed or how it's been used through its history. And the more that I've paid attention to the physical form of the book, the more I've learned how to kind of excavate multiple layers of reading going back through the history of a particular book. So you might see 
um, you know, one person annotating it and then passing it on to another person who then writes something else, perhaps in response to the text, perhaps in response to the earlier annotations. And this is really gold dust for historians looking for information about how people read in the past, because that's really something that's hard to reconstruct, because most reading most of the time doesn't leave any kind of historical trace. It's historically fugitive. But some readers, where they leave marks in their books, or they dog ear the pages, or they break the spine just so you can see how far through the book they've got, or they cut the pages if the pages need cutting open so you can see how far through they've cut the pages. All of those kinds of signs of use help us to reconstruct the life of a book through its history. Yeah, because I was going to talk to you about the, that the, about the your your role here as a historian because there's, there's there's a number one of the things you can really notice about this book is a number of quite unique, quite quirky stories stories I'd never heard of, different examples. I mean, one of the ones was about um, Grangerizing books, which again. Um, it was a great story. It's very quirky. If someone told me that just in the pub, I'd be like, well, that's great. But I felt as if you used it very well because you not only used it to, um, to talk about what you've just talked about, about people personalizing books and books as a historical valuable artifact. Uh, I should say to people, by the way, Grangerizing is a practice where um, people used to add illustrations that they had found or commissioned themselves into the books and it ended up like one volume might end up with five volumes when the illustrations were added but you also used the same example to show how a, a, a very um, how positive a, a, a book could be in 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 somebody's relationships to talk about the Sutherlands, a married couple who um, did this quite a lot. And quite a lot is an understatement. They did it on a, an epic scale. Um, and this is one of the fascinating things about Grangerizing is you know, how do you know when to stop? And people just kind of went on and on and on. And I can imagine that the Sutherlands did this together and it must have been a really important part of their marriage, you know. But the other thing that interests me about Grangerizing is that it, it shows us how our ideas of how you value a book have changed. That, you know, at the end of the 18th and through to the first half of the 19th century, if you really valued a book, you did things to it. You improved it in some way. And um, that was a way of showing how much you valued it. So there are lots of uh, medieval manuscripts in libraries around the world which in the Victorian period were trimmed, rebound, had their edges gilded uh, or otherwise decorated, and often quite a substantial margin was cut off in order to do this. And earlier bindings were taken off and discarded in order to put new beautiful bindings on. Now these bindings are beautiful things in themselves, but modern librarians look on them with absolute <laughs> horror because they say, you know, what have we done to this medieval manuscript and what information about the history of that document has been lost? Now, if we value a book, we leave it alone. We want to keep it as much as possible in its original state. And so, you know, it may be that a book in wrappers will be left in wrappers and not bound. Uh, to keep it as close as possible to its original state. So what it means to value a book has really changed since, you know, 100, 150 years ago. It's interesting because obviously one of the things that helps you to keep a book in its original state would be not to read it. <laughs> yeah, it would be to not read it and to just sort of have it on a shelf and just dust it from time to time. So it's just interesting because there's, there's, there's these two sides. Um, and that's why the, the signs of past use are so interesting because, yeah, just because, you know, I think we all borrow books from libraries that we never get round to reading. We all buy books that we never get round to reading. So, um, you know, possessing a book is not necessarily the same as reading it. And that's why sort of signs of past reading can be really, really helpful. But the fact that you can possess a book without reading it also shows all those other things that books are doing apart from serving as reading matter. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I still keep reference books. I've still got reference books on my shelves and pretty much anything that I want to look up in that kind of reference way, I just Google it or I can just Google it. But sometimes it's really great to pick up a book and find that information. And I, I do enjoy it. It takes me back to my past, to my youth. And it's, I mean, talking about another feature of the book that you had which i really really liked i thought was quite intriguing was um the use of like these interludes where you take a painting and you kind of critique and analyze it and it's a painting that features a book and you look at the role the book played in that painting could you kind of give us some insight into that it's a bit more insight i thought it was a really interesting yeah. way of doing that i mean i i guess the paintings really very um, in little nuggets make the point that the book as a whole is making because it's quite unusual um, at least from the 19th century onwards to be able to read any text in a book that's in a painting mm -hmm. um, and yet books appear in lots and lots of paintings so what are they there for they're there to do all of these other things that I'm interested in in my book um, so for example I write about a painting by Van Gogh called Still Life with Bible, which Van Gogh painted just after his father's death. Now, his father was a, a minister in the church, um, and so the family Bible, which is the centre of this painting, was his book and was obviously a very important book for him. The Bible is a huge, inert mass in the center of the painting painted in kind of sludgy browns and greys uh, of the kind that Van Gogh went in for in his earlier uh, painting life but then in front of the bible is this yellow back novel it's a French novel novel by Zola um, and it's bright yellow and it's this splash of color and this book is obviously Vincent's and so he sets up here a kind of elegy for his father in the uh, painting of the Bible, but also a painting about their difficult relationship with one another. Here you've got two books that are sort of signifying the diverging identities of two very different people. So I thought that was a really good example of how we could kind of use the book as a symbol of identity, as a way of sort of structuring a self and displaying that self to others. And uh, the painting does that really nicely. Yeah, I thought it was well done with all of them. And it, I did note that the Van Gogh was next to your chapters on relationships and the books, how, how books relate, while the other, the other paintings that you looked at were, seemed very specific to the parts that you put them in, which I thought was great. Was there any um, other paintings that you thought, oh, they just missed the cut? <laughs> Yeah, I did. Originally, I wanted to have uh, a painting for every chapter. Um, and but some of them worked better than others and some of them, you know, fitted in with the chapters better than others. So some of them got cut out in the process of editing. Um, and I think the the one actually that I most regretted cutting out, but there wasn't a place for it, um, was not a painting at all, but a sculpture, Anselm Kiefer's sculpture called Book with Wings which I don't know if you've seen it, um, is uh, a large book, a uh, folio sized book on a lectern, a metal lectern, with these enormous angelic wings unfolding from it. And the whole thing is cast, uh, I think in bronze, um, and it looks impossible. The wings are just much larger than you think they ought to be. The whole thing looks like it ought to topple over. But it's the most perfect kind of encapsulation, I think, of the way that um, a book can be a, a very solid physical object and yet at the same time can take flight in the imagination of a reader. That on one hand, it's kind of anchored to the earth by the lectern. On the other hand, it's sort of, you know, reaching for the heavens and about to take off. So I really, I love that sculpture and I wanted to write about it. But... I couldn't find the right place to get it into the book, unfortunately. Yeah, I can kind of see why, because um, you're looking, you know, the books have that dichotomy, but you're, you've looked to focus particularly on the book as, say, 
focus away from the book as capturing the imagination by what's in it and more at the social and physical sort of aspects of it. I mean, like when you think about your subtitle of the book, it's why they mean more than words. So that's, you're looking at, you're looking beyond the words. I think you, you said something to me earlier when we were chatting um, about how quite often the, the idea of a good book was a book where you just forgot about what, what you, that you were reading at all and were transported somewhere else. So all the different things, the cultural significances and the physical were almost forgotten and you were looking in a way to address that balance, I think. And yeah, I think the cultural, I mean, I think we all kind of, we, we all engage in books in that social way that we all kind of queue to get our books signed. We, I'm, I'm a member of a book group. I queue to get books signed. So I've missed buses to get books signed. Um, and, you know, as a librarian, a library is this, this sort of cathedral of the book, as it were, cathedral of the mind. That whole thing has it's been a huge part of my life. Like yourself, um, books changed my life and, and where I was going with it. Um, but there's definitely a passion. I mean, there's a passion around libraries um, and there's a passion around books and reading. Um, what do you think it is about books that have led to this engagement and I think you've said before about the kind of almost opposite that books and read not so much books but reading is sometimes not thought as being the mo the great thing that it it always is you know yeah I mean I think what's fascinating one of the fascinating things about books is the way that they exist right on that boundary between individual imaginative life and social life. Um, so by that I mean that being absorbed in a book can be a deeply intimate kind of experience. And yet at the same time, you know, we display those books on our shelves. We give them to each other at Christmas. We make them the, uh, you know, we give them as prizes and make them the centerpiece of rituals of prize giving and things like that. So they're, they're both pointing inwards towards our inner life, our imaginative life, and they're pointing outwards. And that's why, um, you know, when you go into somebody's house, I, I'm sure you do this, I certainly do this, when you go into someone's house, you always look along the bookshelves, if there are some there, because really it's quite a remarkable thing that you can see something about what this person knows, what this person loves, what this person values, all kind of arrayed there for you to look at in their living room and so that's what i mean when i say that they're kind of pointing in two directions outwards to the social inwards towards the personal yeah i think it's also something that you do when you're looking at those books if it's somebody you've just met say a friend of a friend has uh, and the friends invite you to the party you, you quite often look at those books and go look for common ground yeah um, look for something that um, a book that you may have read or um, something that um, a similar a topic that you're you're interested in and if you do find that you're like that's brilliant you know this this could be a new friend and sometimes you also if it's somebody that you admire you look for books that you think I wonder I'll ask them about that and maybe I should read it it's a great yeah. thing for that um, books are great for that kind of social sort of interaction and as you say book groups are um, a great thing for that interaction and there's some fantastic stories that you have about the history of the book group and about different types of book group and the evolution of that um, which I'd, I'd, I'd urge anyone that's in a book group to read this it's a great book for that and Again, I mean, I'm, I'm really fascinated by, the, by this, what I call bibliographic sociability, the, mm -hmm. the way that books bring people into social groups and kind of, you know, it's not just that social groups thrive on books, but in a funny way, books seem to be doing this. They seem to be drawing groups of people together around shared interests, but also just around the shared physical object of the book. Yes, it's, it's, and it's sometimes it's not so much about shared interest, it's about how your community has been a number of times now that I can think of where 
somebody a book that I've read that I found not brilliant has has kind of been in you know it has my views been changed by the people in a, in a book group and I've, right. I've looked people at don't it join book groups in order to you know agree with each other right yes. you don't go each month or whatever to sort of sit in in universal choruses of appreciation they go to disagree um, mm. and one thing that's that's really interesting in studies of book groups is that they're overwhelmingly more popular with women um, and some book groups, quite a, a high percentage of book groups, exclude men. Um, and those that aim to include both genders uh, tend to have a lot more women than men in. And one reason for this seems to be that book groups value a kind of talking that's often gendered female. That is a kind of talking that's not aiming to make arguments to convince people to win people over to your side to win a debate but rather is just an airing of different views um, an appreciation of diverging viewpoints and a kind of space for sharing of different ideas and that seems to be the kind of talking that book clubs really uh, value and that book club members benefit from i certainly value that i mean i agree that you you know the thing about about book groups is that you don't have to agree at the end of it but one of the things i do like about book groups is when somebody gives you a fresh insight into something that you a, a, a title you pretty much dis dismissed as rubbish mm. do you know what i mean and you've said it and they've said but what about this and it's made you think more about it i mean books are a great thing for bringing people together um and yeah, there's also, I mean, talking about the title and, you know, why the books mean more than words. You do talk and you've talked a lot already about the physicality of the books. Um, do you feel um, that books, the, the kind of physical structure of books, do you feel in some ways that that adds to the reading experience as, a, as opposed to perhaps you've talked about things like a e-reader, you also talk yeah. about scrolls. I mean, I think it, um, I think it, I, I would say it inflects the reading experience, it shapes the reading experience, and that can be positive or negative. Um, but I think you're always aware of the book that you've got in your hand, you know, is it um, a, a plush looking hardback that's been expensively produced and it's been looking beautiful like that one that you've got there? Um, you know, that tells you straight away, okay, well, this is a book that um, somebody valued enough to put this kind of energy and effort into developing it and making it look as good as this. Or, you know, if you're reading a, a, a novel, you know, I quite often teach novels from the 19th century, and there um, students have a very different experience if they read the novel in an edition, which has an introduction by a scholar, which has a big wedge of end notes at the end explaining it. Um, that's a different experience from reading a free version on your e-reader. And why? Because even if you don't read the end notes, even if you don't read the introduction, and believe me, many students don't, um, you still understand just from picking up the physical book that this is a novel that somebody thought was worth reissuing and writing an introduction for, and also that they felt like it needed some explanation. It was going to be distant enough from you that it would need some notes to explain it. So just having those kind of features, those paratextual features in the book, is um, sending you a message. And as a result, it's kind of shaping the way that you might approach that book. So I think, and you know, this is happening in all kinds of different ways, right? I talk in the book about how um, you can recognize, if I ask you to imagine what a novel that you might pick up in an airport and read on the plane and throw away at the end of the plane flight, imagine what that looks like, right? You know what it looks like. It's going to be a small pocket size book. It's probably going to have a foil uh, lettering on the cover that make the author's name is possibly going to be one of the biggest things there. Um, it's going to be on cheap paper. The spine isn't going to be very strong. It's definitely going to be a paperback. All of those things are part of what's telling you that this is the kind of book 
that you would read in that kind of situation. It's only going to be read once. It's going to be read on the move. It's not something that you need to sort of sit down in your study and pay close attention to. It's not something that you're going to go back to and study again and again. That kind of book is completely different from the book that you might find in an academic library, which is likely to be on uh, acid-free paper with a, a hard back, with a sewn spine, and in lots of ways is going to tell you, before you've even read a word of it, this is a book to take seriously. This is a book that you need to pay attention to. You should read it at a desk. Lots of people are going to read this book. It's going to last a long time. You know, it will lay flat on the desk so you can take notes from it. All of those things are, are shaping our reading experience. Yes, um, very much so. And yeah, people do have these opinions about, I mean, one of the big things as a librarian is the discussions you might have with people who come in and sort of tell you which books deserve to be in your library or don't deserve to be in your library. And that's um, the different levels of value people put on different books. The other thing I thought was an observation about the physical book, as opposed to an ebook, is that the physical book lends itself to browsing as in um, to picking something up and just kind of going through it and sort of, let's have a wee look at this and see if it's a book I would like, which yeah. an ebook doesn't. And I think that's why it's so important for say some, someone like Amazon to, to have reviews. Yes. Because you can't like just skim through it quickly and say, Oh, I like how that said, Oh, I like the fact that it's got a map in the front or yeah. as you said, the different things associated with it. I no, think it's right. It's, and you see those, you know, uh, Amazon and other online retailers and ebook suppliers are really working hard to try and replicate some of the ways in which we experience paper books. Um, in ways that aren't necessarily part of their technology. So it's interesting, for example, that most e-readers arrange the text into pages. Uh, whereas on our computers, when we're looking at a website or a, a word processing document, we usually scroll through it. But e-readers don't do that. They use pages. And that's because they're trying to impersonate, um, replicate an experience that you have with a physical book or similarly browsing you know Amazon's kind of people who bought this also bought function that allows you to see similar books and their look inside function and the way that they now um, uh, show you pictures of the book relative to a, a, a figure so that you can sort of get a sense of how big the book is um, physically all of that is designed to replicate the, the kind of physical and tactile experience that we have when we're browsing books. And, you know, they, they understand this very well because they understand that that's one of the things that they can't offer. And so they have to offer these kinds of um, substitutes for it. I, find, I always find it interesting in terms of like each book is in that sense, each title is unique in so many ways. Uh, I mean, I, I know from experience that the types of electronic ordering system that you might have, where you're buying 10 boxes of nails at such and such a price, it doesn't work for books because you're trying to buy a series of unique titles. And as yeah. you say, the uh, in the book that the type, you know, the, the book is not necessarily unique. You make it, you, you look to make it unique, but the actual title, that one book is essentially unique barring. That's right. And... Yeah. You've got, if you uh, think about paper books, you have, you know, every paper book will only contain one text, the words printed on its pages. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't scrape the text off and replace it, which you, actually can with vellum that was you know, before paper if we go back to pre-print uh, people do reuse the paper the right uh, the vellum writing surface um, but your kindle can hold thousands of books you know it could potentially hold all the books you'll ever want to read um, and so there's a very different relationship between the physical form and the textual content 
in an e-reader or on screen than there is on a paper book. So that means that paper books can be designed to suit their contents. Art books can be large and uh, you know full of glossy color images. Airport novels can be small and easy to take on the plane. So um, the, the form of the book can be tailored to its content in a physical book in a way that isn't true of e-books. And on that, just um, a final question here. Um, how much of a say did you have as the author in the design of um, your book in this case? And are you happy with how it turned out? I'm extremely happy with how it turned out. I, I had a little bit of input, but I, I didn't really need very much because I've, I've got mine as well. I was just delighted with uh, how it turned out. I think um, that this, you know, it looks like it belongs in the library at Hogwarts. And uh, that's, I'm just so happy with that. But um, the one reason we're talking is because the paperback is about to come out and the paperback looks completely different. Um, but to my mind, just as good. And that really, actually kind of was really nice that they decided to go in two different directions with the hardback and the paperback because it really makes the point and brings the point home to me that books you know the the physical form of the book does shape the reading experience and different physical forms shape that experience in different ways not necessarily that one is better than the other but you know if you see a book with this kind of um lovely uh, antique sort of design mm -hmm. And then you see the paperback has a much more modern, clean uh, kind of design. That, that, that is shaping your response to the book in different ways, undoubtedly. Yeah, it certainly does. And I like the, it's a dark brown along the spine as well. I thought, yeah, it's, it's like, as you say, a, 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 an older, more traditional book, whilst the paperback with the blue and the, they both feature kind of, books flying about but just different colors and things i i thought it was a, it was a, it was a good contrast and the paperback is out this month isn't it um uh, that's right the beginning of october yeah beginning of october so paperback should be out by this time and i would encourage anyone to get this book if you enjoy books and you enjoy reading and if you don't why are you watching something at a book festival so well, if, you, if you don't you know buy it and give it to somebody who does yes i would say that as well because it's great i mean there's i, c I could see myself rereading one of the things i didn't really talk about but i thought was really important was i i could the chapters are very discreet and very distinct it doesn't you know you could read one chapter of this just on the relationships people have with their books or the relationships the world or society as a whole has with their books you you know it's a it's it's, it's a great book to read from start to finish, but it's also a great book for dipping in and out of. And I'm sure I'll reread bits and pieces of it and it will go into my library under Zeds, which is Library of Congress for where you put books on bibliography. And That's thanks right. for the Library of Congress very modestly puts books about books under Z at the end of the, the alphabet, as though they're a kind of appendix to the rest of the world's knowledge. Yeah. And once the library's open again, I'm sure we'll, we'll be buying a copy of this in as well. But you can get it at any kind of good bookshops. Get it at the Portobello Bookshop. We, we like to encourage people to shop local. And I'm sure you, you'll be able to get it there. But in, in any kind of um, good bookshop, online bookshop. But certainly makes a difference to read it as a book. So I'd read it rather than download it. But you can do either. So thanks very much, okay. Tom. Really, I'm um, really Thank great you. speaking to you. And as I said, it's a shame I won't be able to get this signed, but we'll, we'll work something out, hopefully. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks very much.